in of course, let me thank you, Kevin, for agreeing to, to do this. You were a great hit when you came and spoke um, in Scotland before, and um, yeah, thank a lot you of people me. were keen for you to come back. And we welcome you back at some time when people I are know, able to travel. I know, I want to come back. Well, this would be a great occasion to uh, just to have a chat with you for the benefit of the now several thousand people who follow us to share your views on what the world is going to look like when we emerge from this um, pandemic. Sure. Um, and I guess when we will, because it looks like there are waves coming back, even in Wuhan at the moment, yes, sir. Yes, brought sir. by people returning. So if we, if we could sort of chat through that, and then, sure. then um, Doug's got some other questions, some of which have been put through um, okay. our, par our partners and supporters. When you're ready. Yeah, I'm ready. Yes, I'm just switching something off, but we can actually talk whenever you're ready. I'm ready. Okay, Doug. Kevin, good afternoon. Um, I think, broadly speaking, it, it sort of as an opener, we're really just trying to understand how significant and what sort of fundamental change this COVID might bring about, particularly, um, I think, in terms of the markets and economics, but, but also in terms of the role of the state, perhaps, and, and businesses generally. And I know we've, we've seen your article that you've written about advice to businesses in, 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 in the, yeah. in, in the, for tomorrow. So it's, it's really a general question to start on, on that sort of topic, if we may. My view of how significant this is, is really influenced by several realities. One, we've just seen the biggest economic impact of any event since the Second World War start to unfold. And you can measure that in several ways. The size of the interventions by government, $2 trillion in the United States. You could add $600 billion across the uh, the uh, power of the European Union, you can add the UK, you add all that up, and this is somewhere between at least 10 to 15 Marshall Plans, and yet we're not finished. We're just not finished. And the consequence of that massive intervention as to whether or not it will help us save lives and safeguard livelihoods is not yet clear. But we also know that the economic cost in terms of the hit to GDP that we're beginning to see is also of an order of magnitude that outweighs anything else we have seen. So the scale of the intervention, the size of the hit to GDP, and you add to that, of course, we aren't done. So I think it's a reasonable conclusion to say just an aggregate size that's got an, an impact that's uh, of a different scale to what we've seen. But then you have to add to it, how's it gonna impact behaviors? How's it impacting the way people will react to each other, to uh, the way in which they shop, the way in which they eat, the way in which they think about their security and their safety? That's one big piece. So I think you put all this together and you have a very, very significant break with what we all thought would happen. In fact, one of the phrases I've grown to quite like is by a great American philosopher called Yogi Berra, who was a baseball player. It's a stupid game, so let's not worry about that. But he did have this line that the future ain't what it used to be. And I think that's where we are. The future ain't what it used to be. It's now no longer the case that we can assume that the trends we were all observing are going to continue. And so I'm happy to elaborate, but we actually now are seeing at least seven elements of what, what, we, what we're calling the next normal could entail. And I think those seven elements together represent quite a substantive break to what I think we would previously have thought the future would hold for each of us. I'm happy to go into the seven if that would be useful, so that was a cue. No, that's, that's um, we were familiar with that from your article. Um, yeah. One specific, given the, the, the level of government intervention around the world, um, I mean, we had a specific question from one of our investment partners about whether you think that global trade growth is now destined to grow more slowly than global GDP. So that was a specific question. But, but also, I think more generally around, are you worried about the level of government intervention and, and the, you know, the following recession that will, will inevitably follow? Well, I think we have to understand that the government, in a way, has become the payer, lender and insurer of last resort. And therefore, the reality is that government has a bigger role to play in the economy than it had before this crisis unfolded. That's something which clearly some will view with trepidation, others will view as a necessary and important factor in stabilising a very difficult situation. So I think we need to unpack a little bit why people are concerned and what they're actually concerned about. It is clear that the intervention of government was needed to 
safe, secure and help private sectors across the globe. So that's why we are where we are. The question now is how will that then play out in the future? Will government choose to stay in the game of running the economy at a scale that it didn't have before? Or will it actually choose to pull back? I think we're going to find that play out differently in different parts of the world. And therefore, I think a sweeping generalization is not going to work. It's not going to work in part because the way in which governments have chosen to intervene is very different. Some have made loans. In effect, you could call them bridging loans. Others have made equity investments where they end up owning increased parts of the economy. So let's just be careful before we leap to a blanket assertion that every government is going to act in the same way. Moreover, I think for some governments, they're going to view one of their key tasks is to get out of the business of business. And I think we're going to see that unfold. In fact, one of the biggest challenges government may actually have is how is it going to wind back its involvement, even if it doesn't want to play the part that it now finds itself playing because of the degree to which it's intervened in countries like the United Kingdom and in large parts of Europe. So I think that is a different question than what's going to happen to global trade. Because far more a driver of global trade is actually how we are going to react to the reality that a lot of the borders that have been taken down over many years have now been put back up. One of the points uh, we make in one of the articles we literally are publishing today is that if Hannibal was a peace-loving person, which he wasn't, but if he was a peace-loving person and he was choosing to cross the Alps today, he wouldn't be able to do it. He'd be turned back at the gates or on the hills or on the mountains. And that's the reality we now see across the globe. Barriers have been put back up. Physical checks are taking place. That's going to have a big part to play, irregardless of how the economics of government involvement play through. The second thing that's going to have a bigger role, I think, in all of this is the prioritization of resilience over efficiency. For investors, indeed for consumers, for business leaders, one of the things we've all just learned is these extended just-in-time supply chains that allow for great efficiency actually don't have the resilience in them to withstand shocks of an unprecedented scale that we've just seen. No surprise, because those shocks were not envisaged. Well, guess what? Now we've envisaged them. Now we've realized them and experienced them. So that's going to have a real effect on how far goods get traded and how much we see a trend towards reshoring or onshoring, whatever phrase you want to use for bringing back bits of the supply chain and anchoring it domestically. And the other part of this, the third force at work, is consumer behavior. Consumers have just had a shock to them. I mean, we've all had it. And how they choose to react is going to be important. Are they going to turn inwards and value more that which they can see nearby, local sourcing, local products, local people? Or are they going to continue to want to have stuff come from far across the globe? We don't know. How that behavior plays out is going to have a huge impact on the question you ask. So I think global trade, which incidentally was on a decline if you measure it in terms of physical goods, what was on the increase was services and actually data and information, which were growing at rates that were exponential. The question I think we really have to ask ourselves is, how far will the global trade and physical goods continue to decline? And will the growth in services and data and other forms of bringing us closer together be suspended, stopped, or resumed in a post-COVID environment? I don't think we know the answer to that. In fact, if you look at China, you can begin to see some bounce back in some of the things which may lead you to believe that we're a bit more resilient, we're a bit more willing to bounce back. And therefore, I think we should not assume that there's a slamming of the door on the trends that were favoring services and data. But I do think physical goods and services, physical goods rather, are going to continue to decline. I think that's going to be harder to resuscitate and the barriers that are coming into place will be harder to take down. It's quite interesting. Stephen King, who we were talking to uh, at HSBC not so long ago, said that uh, you know, China had run into a wall, but it was rather like a rubber wall. There, there would be a bounce back from it. But I also was minded to say that um, Doug, who has a, a military logistics background, we always used to say in the army that you had to be very careful that your supply chain didn't get too long uh, because it could be threatened and cut off and then you'd, you'd had it. But I wanted to ask you a question also put to us about um, Hong Kong, which of course you know very well, the extent to which um, Hong Kong's future is now in, in doubt and, and will not perhaps be the same. 
Well, I think Hong Kong's a, a city state that's been going through a lot of transitions over many years, and they predate 1997, frankly, um, because yeah. its role shifted dramatically from being a physical entrepôt where goods were traded and sold to being a financial sector and a gateway to China. I think the question that now persists is how much of that gateway status for China is Hong Kong needed by the mainland China, and how much is it just a convenient place that people like to live because mm -hmm. they'd rather be there than perhaps somewhere else in the region in order to do business with China. Yeah. I actually think Hong Kong will be okay. And I think it will be okay because one of the things that is true is if you think about China and the nature of the Chinese economy, China's economy is now a domestic economy in the sense that it's driven by domestic demand. Yeah. And of course, that domestic demand means that China can actually source a lot of what it needs in China. And it's actually less dependent on the rest of the world than the world is dependent on China. Yeah. So it is the case that for the world, it's very important to be able to export cars and other goods into China. But for China, actually, they only export somewhere between 9% and 12%, depending which metric you use of their GDP, which is a relatively modest amount. I've seen slightly higher numbers, but you don't get to significantly higher numbers. And therefore, China is going to continue to develop because it's 1.4 billion people, because it has a massive demand for goods and services mm. in China. Mm. The real question is, will that be satisfied purely by Chinese domestic production? Can it be satisfied purely by Chinese domestic production? Or will it continue to need a gateway to the rest of the world? I think it will still need a gateway. And the question is, is the growth that's still occurring and going to occur in China such that even if it tails a bit, they don't need quite as much from the rest of the world, they still need some way into the rest of the world? And I think the answer to that question is yes. And I think China, Hong Kong still has a role to play. But I think the bigger question for the region is really, will China continue to be this force that helps the world grow because it's sucking in so much good products sorry products and goods from the west and from other parts of the world but will it now turn to satisfy that demand through local production to a degree which actually creates more of an issue outside of china than inside china and is that going to impact the belt and road initiative i mean that we, we've seen some rumblings about that and debt forgiveness and one thing and another given the current economic travails that people are facing well, I think the reality of the countries that are the recipients of the funds from China and the infrastructure development have changed. I mean, their economics yeah. have changed. And one of the biggest things that might change them is if we do see a retreat from global supply chains. Remember, many of these countries are just that. They are places where goods are made that are then put on the global supply network. And if that pulls back and people start to reshore production, well, that is going to challenge those economies. It's mm. one of the reasons why and I am cautious about this too, when we start to say things like resilience over efficiency, let's be clear, the second order effects of that on parts of Southeast Asia and other developing economies would be very negative and yeah. could in effect create more inequality, more hardship in those countries, whilst leaving the developed, so-called developed markets okay and more secure and more resilient. That's a high price that the developing world will be paying so that the rest of us in the developed world can live more securely. And we need to think about the second order effects of that. And I think that's going to be a big challenge for the world if we start to really pull back on global supply networks. And that's part of the Belt and Road conundrum. But I think that's clearly the case that we are going to see adjustments, probably pretty substantial adjustments to how that initiative plays out. So Kevin, picking perhaps up on that point, um, some people are saying that they see because China's experienced the virus earlier and because their economy is ramping back up again now, that they might be in a better position overall to, to take advantage of the situation. But given what you said about their dependence upon the rest of the world, maybe that you don't subscribe to that view. Well, I partially do subscribe to it because to be clear, their dependence on the rest of the world is much less than the rest of the world's dependence on China, much less. And so China definitely has the so-called opportunity advantage, whichever phrase you want to use, to rebuild its economy through domestic demand and domestic supply in a way that other countries do not. And so I do think China has an advantage in that sense. But that advantage is a theoretical one, because in reality, China does require, does depend on some very important components from the rest of the world. 
an obvious point, but if you think about the technology side of China, China imports more chips than it imports oil. It is very dependent on the rest of the world for semiconductors. That may change, but it's not changing tomorrow. China also is dependent on critical components, whether it's for its automotive sector, or let's take something that's vitally important to the world today, ventilators. Bloomberg had a very interesting piece recently that reminded us that a number of the Chinese ventilator companies were having challenges assembling their products because some of the key components came from Switzerland and Italy. And those components are not being shipped. And because those components are not being shipped, until China can create a domestic supply, their ability to manufacture ventilators was constrained. And that's true in a number of different sectors and parts of the economy. But it is the case that China is less dependent on the rest of the world than the world is dependent on China. And that does ultimately mean it is able to develop and produce more from its own domestic resources, which does mean it's less exposed perhaps than some of the other countries to the current challenges. Kevin, I'm just conscious of the time because we said we wouldn't take up too much of sure. your time. One of the big challenges at the moment for the UK government is um, how to handle China. I mean, there is a view that we should accept the fact that going forward, the relationship with the United States of America may be somewhat fraught. It depends, of course, what happens in November. And anybody who can predict that is a, is a genius. We shall see. The back, back kid, Donald Trump. We never quite know what will happen. But um, it, it's an issue about what the right approach to foreign policy is. Are, are the Chinese to be trusted in the way that Cameron and Osborne, I suppose, wanted the new great golden age of Anglo-Chinese or British-Chinese relations to be? Or do we have to be very careful still for a variety of reasons and sup with a long spoon? I mean, what, what's your view of that? I think it's a heavily political question. I think just looking at it, not as a politician, but as someone who recognizes the sheer scale of China and its role in the world from a demand point of view, as we just discussed, or a supply point of view, mm. I think it's very hard to ignore the Chinese economy and to say that we can just put it to one side. I think we've also learned that this world is a very interconnected world and the ability to build barriers is really not sustainable when it comes to, for example, some of the experiences we're all having now, the human tragedy and cost of the current reality of this pandemic underscores, I think, the need to have global cooperation. I think it underscores the need to have a, an ability to talk to each other and work with each other. And if anything, I think one of the ways in which the world can react, clearly it can go in one of two directions. We can choose to have a world where the barriers get higher the degree of uh, skepticism or questioning around how we interact with each other get higher. Uh, we can have more surveillance, more interventions, lots of negatives you can portray. Or we can decide that actually one of the lessons from this is we actually need some global institutions that are able to help and deliver and control the risks that come from this globally connected world that we have, that the multilateral institutions are more important, not less important. So let's see which path we take. Uh, I have to be honest and say I subscribe to the second path, but I am also eyes wide open. There are some realities that the politicians do have to deal with. Uh, clearly, different principles, concepts of how these governments operate do give rise to real challenges, and those challenges I don't want to gloss over. I think that's for the politicians to resolve. Yeah. So, well, sorry, the world's greatest uh, consulting firm. It's um, surely uh, a terrific challenge for you to take your own clients forward and help them deal with the complexities of a life that is more complicated than it was six months ago. It certainly is. And this, you know, we should have begun by saying the obvious, this life is more complicated because we're talking about people's lives. And so for all that we talk about the economic case, the, the livelihoods, I think let's also remember there's an awful lot of amazing work being done right now by the healthcare frontline, by yep. researchers, by developers. And I think one of the positives out of this is the science and the, amazing science that's being put in service of the global world, of the world that we live in. Yeah. I hope that will be a positive that we can all look back on, but these are tough times, so no question. I appreciate the words. Well, Kevin, we very much appreciate at the Asia Scotland Institute you giving up the, the, your time to share your thoughts with us. We're enormously grateful. And so on my behalf as chairman, and I'm sure speaking for Doug as our Institute Director and our many, many followers, thanks for joining us on this thank meet you. from no, sunny Florida. You. Um, to Bel Riki. Good to talk to you. Yeah. Thank you very Bel much. Riki, good night and uh, take care, everyone. Thanks. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye.